Welcome back to BAI's Engineering Knowledge Series, the place where we speak to the specialists that make everything in broadcast transmission happen, going behind the scenes and gaining insight from them on the role they play to keep broadcast services on air 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. My name is Masood Rasooli, Head of National Broadcasters at BAI Australia, and this is Session 2. Last time we got together, I asked you to stop and give a thought as to what it takes for you to be able to watch or listen to your favorite shows 24 by 7, 365 days a year. And then put a face on the people who are working behind the scenes for you to make that happen. Today, I'd like to take you out of your living room and into the outdoors. And for those currently in lockdown, you may enjoy this one. I'd like you to picture the Australian landscape. What do you see? Cattle stations, rabbit fences, the red desert, and Uluru, vast plains, rolling hills, kangaroos, the bush, mountains, thick rainforests, beaches, the ocean, perhaps busy cities. As you scan the horizon and marvel at the beauty of this country, wherever you have found yourself, your eye catches something on the highest part of the ground. You look closer and notice it's a big tower. Did you catch yourself asking if it's one of BAIs? Or did you wonder what it takes to look after one of those or a network of them and how the signal that comes from the tower always reaches your TV and radio every time you turn it on? Today, Grant Shapcott, Manager of Antennas and Structures at BAI Australia, will share with us the role he and his team play in making sure that happens across all those different landscapes we just described. Grant is the Engineering Design Authority on all things related to antennas and structures in the broadcast network. Grant, welcome. Thank you, Masood. That's quite an intro. <laughs> <laughs> well, there, there's there's a bit of truth to all of that, isn't there? Oh, it definitely is. There's uh, some of our sites are located in some of the yep. uh, most beautiful parts of the country, for sure. Yep. Yeah, yeah. It's an, and, and it's an amazing country too. I mean, very Absolutely. very different landscape from from coast to coast. Yes. Absolutely. So, Grant, tell us a bit about yourself. <laughs> Well, um, where do I start? Look, I guess I've been in broadcast engineering now since I left school. Went in and got uh, started with broadcasting, uh, electronics technician, and I guess after the first three or so years, fell into the area of antenna systems and have pretty much been working with antennas and and structures uh, and everything associated with that ever since. I have been working now with BAI for the last uh, 13 years. But prior to that, was still working on the BAI network in a contract um, capacity. So all up, probably working on the network for the last uh, 27 odd years. So you know it well. I know most of it well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> excellent, excellent. Well, look, it's it's a vast network. It's big, you know. Um, you know, last I checked, or a little birdie told me anyway, that we've got something like... 674 antennas, 599 structures, and a cableway. Yeah, that's correct. Um, yeah, big network and a growing network. And uh, yeah, that definitely keeps us busy with our teams we have to, to maintain yeah. it. Yeah. So so that's that's a lot of antennas. It's a lot of structures and very specialized around the cableway. Um, do you do that all on your own or have you got a team that helps <laughs> you out? <laughs> Not even if I wanted to. <laughs> no, look, I've got a fairly fairly substantial team, uh, a lot of um, specialist teams. Mm-hmm. And I think the easiest way probably to uh, to look at that is probably look at the assets that we're responsible for. Right. And I guess the first asset group that we're responsible for in my team is uh, structures. So as you say, we've got nearly 600 odd structures in, in the mm-hmm. network. We also look after the antenna systems, uh, all the broadcast antenna systems. So digital television, uh, FM radio, digital audio broadcast or DAB plus as well. And um, and we also look after the yeah, cableway. We have a cableway system, yeah. a cable car system that goes to one of our sites in far north Queensland, Mount Bellendinker. So we have a, um, we've got to maintain that cableway system as well. It's the only access to site other than helicopter. Wow. Okay. Mm. <laughs> sounds like, sounds like it could be a bit of fun, but... <laughs> but... You tend to do a bit of travel, that's for sure. Some yeah. of the teams, some of the members of the teams definitely get around. So the teams we have, 
that maintains all of these. I guess we can we can briefly touch on them. Yeah, very specialist teams. Um, I guess we start with the structures team. They do uh, they basically look at um, life cycle management of those structures, whether that be refurbishment. Uh, they do all the inspections on those structures. They look at the loadings. So they've got structural engineers within that team. So we make sure the structures are fit for purpose in different you know uh, environment environments that they they may sit in around the country. We have an antenna team that basically looks after all the antenna systems so again the life cycle planning so whether there's any um, replacement refurbishment upgrades required on those antenna systems they also um, respond to faults within those antenna systems and yeah any works that are required from a maintenance point of view that antenna team looks after that as well because we've got the cableway system we have a dedicated team that looks after that cableway system does all the maintenance on that cableway as well as does all the operations so you know drives that car to ferry people up to our uh, up to our site we also have a rigging team does a lot of the maintenance on the structures and some of the antenna systems around the country and we have an eme team uh, or electromagnetic emissions team, very important. So their main role is uh, obviously safety and compliance around the network, doing surveys of the um, various sites and making sure everything's compliant and everyone that works in and around them, including the general public around these sites are, are kept safe. And lastly, but uh, not, not by any means the least, is the uh, WPV, uh, wireless planning and validation on I know you're going to ask me that. <laughs> so I jumped in before you did yeah um, so yeah wireless planning and validation so basically it's our coverage area right they do frequency planning coverage planning uh, population mm-hmm. analysis of of you know who gets covered from these various antenna systems right uh, around the country wow so there's a big big breadth across your team so you've got everything that's literally out the site out through to everything within the coverage area and, and that's audience affecting yeah that's right and so if you look at the wpv team for instance i mean they're the the not only do they do the coverage planning and and uh, population analysis to understand who's getting the coverage but they also within that team go out and do the validation of that so they do the measurements the field measurements year on year to make sure that we're still uh, meeting specification um, and those antenna systems are doing what we expect them to be doing. So they have a field team that goes out and does all those measurements every year as well. Fantastic. Look, so thanks for sharing with us um, a bit about your team. It'll be good to hear, I think, um, just around some of the, the principles that you employ with antenna design and, and maybe some of the new, I guess, uh, techniques, methods or technologies that you've employed with some of the new antennas that you've installed? Sure. So I guess uh, everyone knows that analog television, you know, ceased uh, well, nearly 10 years ago now, maybe eight or 10 years ago. So it's been digital television ever since then. The benefit to us is that, you know, you had these large um, analog antenna systems that, TV antenna systems that are now redundant. And so that gives us a bit of aperture on the structure that has enabled us to basically look at the structure and work out if there's better ways we can do certain things. So one of the designs we're we're starting to look at a bit more is double aperture antenna systems. So the double aperture, mainly in FM, but FM radio, but double aperture just means you're basically doubling the size of the antenna system. Now, when you when you do that, it means that you don't need as much power in the transmitter. So you can effectively halve the transmitter power. Um, not only is that good for the environment, uh, uses less power, reduces the carbon footprint, etc. But yeah, we can tailor those antenna systems to to really get into the areas that we're we're trying to target for our customers. That's brilliant. So if you're putting less an- less power into the antenna, does that mean you get less wear and tear on all the components as well? Yeah, it, 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 there's a whole lot of things that go into it, but it yeah. means that yeah, you don't need as as um, high a power rating for those uh, for those yeah. antenna systems. So you know, there's less stress on the components mm-hmm. um, as well. Absolutely, and it, it reduces the the overall EME um, around that structure. So access yeah. is improved as well for workers when the antenna systems are up for replacement or when we have new services coming on. We've got other, um, I guess design principles that we also look at, which is um, around uh, fully screened antennas, which is basically enclosing the whole antenna system with the back screen. And and that 
again reduces the uh, the RF or the EME back into the structure, which helps us with access. Means we don't have to reduce power so much for our customers, um, and the end listener or the end viewer um, doesn't get affected as much when we're doing any maintenance works on the structure. Oh, that's brilliant, and I guess it creates, as you said, a safer environment. Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's it's a it's a win win on both both yeah. of those uh, both those counts. That's fantastic. All right, so like. Where we have scenarios where we can't have the fully screened antennas to, to stop the EME from coming into the structure, but we've still got to be able to go in and access it. Um, wh what do we do then? Can you talk us through perhaps some of the, the equipment that we use or perhaps other techniques that we employ around creating safe zones for working? Sure. I mean, we have, depends on the class of the site, but we will have either temporary antenna or, or standby antenna systems. If it's, a, if it's a large construction job that we have to do, we might put up a temporary system like we've done at some of the sites. Just recently, we've had to utilize helicopters to fly on a temporary antenna system at the top of the tower. That will, you know, transmit the service for the period of time that we're doing the works on the, on the main uh, main antenna system. We also utilize RF protection suits, which is like a, an overall um, suit that you put on, but it's 70% Nomex, 30% stainless steel thread, and it acts like a Faraday cage, which effectively means that you're isolated from the RF. So, you know, we employ other, um, you know, PPE like that as well. So, so that you, you weigh it up and you, you work out the best way f that you can, um, continue the work, but also keep the services um, on air. Fantastic. Um, speaking of, I guess, service continuity, and that, that seems to be like a big thing for our customers these days. I guess it's always been a major thing, but, you know, we do tend to get a lot more, uh, I don't, probably pressure is not the right word, but maybe it feels like that around avoiding downtime to the greatest extent or minimizing impact to audiences. Um, we know with, with all bits of equipment occasionally there are issues where we'll have a fault or, or something that impacts the service. What's changed over the years around how you and your team respond to faults and, and what tools and, and techniques do you have now at hand that helps you, I guess, identify the fault and resolve it in, in a much faster manner? Yeah, good question. So what we do is, you know, our specialist teams that typically have to fly in to resolve any issues. What we try to get from our field teams first is, is um, get them to sweep the antenna systems, pass back that uh, that information to us so we can analyse the data and try to understand where the fault is and then what spares we we have to take to um, to site to resolve you know such faults it's it's always tricky because you know you can have uh, literally hundreds of connections within these antenna systems and trying to understand exactly where the fault is you know it can be a little bit tricky but yeah some of the um some of the software that we're using now is is helped us out a lot and you're able to to get uh, i guess pinpoint accuracy to to where <laughs> In some cases, <laughs> in, in some cases, yes. I mean, yeah. we've got a we've got a tricky fault. You know, we're utilising yeah. and we have been utilising for the last uh, six or more years. You know, drone technology. Mm -hmm. So we're able to, yeah. you know, fly drones around uh, these antenna systems and basically uh, replicate what the design uh, was, what the design pattern was, and see you know, where the, any issues might be occurring on what face, what direction, what azimuth were from the, from the antenna. So, you know, there's a, there's a few other technologies there like the drones that definitely have um, been game changers for us. So speaking of drones, um, do, do you use them for, for other things or just for, I guess, checking the, the consistency of the antenna and, and pinpointing faults? Yeah, so we've been using drones for antenna and structure inspections now for a few years as well. Yeah, traditionally we've we've always you know basically done climbing inspections, which have been great and they get get the detail we need. But the drone gives a, a whole different view because it's now taking imagery from the outside of the structure. Um, so we typically would use drones and alter, alternate between drones and maybe a climbing inspection, which gives us the best of both worlds. By using drone technology for inspections, that means we don't actually need any outages on the on the services. So it doesn't impact the uh, the end viewers or listeners at all. And the um, you know that that's that's a, a huge plus for us. Um, we don't have to send people climbing up the structure, which is um, improving safety around that as well. So the drone inspections has, has been an, another big game changer for us. So 
We mentioned earlier, you've got something like almost 700 antennas that you look after and about 600 or so uh, structures. How, when something happens, like how do you manage to, to get stuff there in time or, or to transport from, you know, to a very remote location? Like how do we, how do we manage to do all of this and minimize the downtime to services to the greatest extent? Well, in the last uh, 12 to 18 months with COVID, it's been more difficult. <laughs> I'd imagine but, it has, yeah. <laughs> but look, we have, um, we have, uh, we carry a lot of spears and we have uh, these spears strategically placed around Australia, around our sites. So, so uh, in warehouses. So these spears, we can, you know, we don't have to order replacement parts immediately to fix, fix faults. So we can utilize our, our own uh, spears that we hold and, you know, we will fly staff into areas, specialist staff when required, and uh, we'll ship these spears um, as they require. But in some cases, you know, we'll have spears in that area that we can utilize to start with, which is, um, yeah, works well for us. Brilliant. And do we tend to transport these spares ourselves or do we get someone else to help us out? <laughs> so um, it depends. I mean, some of the spares, like if we had to uh, transport, uh, if we needed to replace a, a coax feeder, for instance, which mm -hmm. you know, goes from the transmitter building up into the antenna. Yeah. I mean, some of those feeders are on four metre diameter drums um, and That's... they can only be trans pretty big yeah, it's pretty big <laughs> so they can only be transported with low loaders um right. so yeah we we rely on freight companies specialized freight companies yeah. to transport those for us and some of the equipment the other equipment we we need to ship around it can be quite large as well yeah um yep oh i'd imagine that'd be we're not always talking small components here right like these antennas can be quite big and if they're part of a, a complex panel arrangement they're getting bordering on huge <laughs> Yeah, that's correct. So if you know what your, um, you know, your aerial on your house, your TV aerial, and you know the coax mm -hmm. is probably maybe the size of my little finger, yeah. or the coax we're talking about is, um, you know, probably the size of my leg. You know, it's 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 150 mil across. It's wow. um, it's large coax, so it's yeah. uh, it's big and it's heavy. Yeah. I was going to say, if you've got it from the transmitter all the way up to the antenna, that's got to be quite a few meters, a hundred, maybe 200. <laughs> yeah. So most of our, um, our spare feeder drums that we have would, uh, probably would probably hold about two, four, 240 meters. And most of the, the runs that would probably cover, uh, yeah, that would cover most of the feeder runs we have 240 meters. Yep. Wow. That's uh, that's a lot of feeder. It's pretty lengthy. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so like you touched a little bit on, on EME before and, and obviously safety is, is very, very important, particularly when we're talking about um, working in high radiation areas, you know, the, the consequences of getting it wrong can be quite catastrophic. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how we manage um, EME in our business? Sure. So uh, we have a, it's a small team, but it's a very specialized team. And with our EME, I mean, we don't have the luxury to be able to necessarily turn the services off um, because we don't you know, have another site very close by that can pick up the coverage you know, like a like a mobile phone site might do. So we have to, you know, manage the service and keep the service on air in a way that is still safe for everyone to work, which typically requires either down powering, switching of antenna systems to other uh, standbys, standby antenna systems on the on the structure or on an alter, alternate structure on the site. So we go out and we do surveys of all of these structures, and it's important to understand, you know, the exact levels up up the structures so that when we do plan any works, we've got that detail and we can accurately request those, um, you know, those, those down powering, down powers for the, uh, from the customers. And I guess having that, that accurate information helps, I guess, firstly, find a space, safe working space, but also knowing that information helps us then communicate to our customers exactly what those impacts will be. And, and at least they can then plan around that. Yeah, absolutely. And that ties back in with, you know, the WPV team, as we talked earlier, you know, we, we look at the EME information, we, we work out what we need to do to access certain areas. And then we, the WPV team will take that and they'll look at it and they'll go, well, how does that impact the coverage? And, you know, then we can work together as a, as a you know, a, a unit to basically work out, well, is there another way to do it? Can we, can we do it a better way so that we don't impact the services as much? Um, so there's a lot of different options when, when you're trying to plan some of these major works on site. 
sounds like there's quite a few variables to sort of take into account here. <laughs> Yeah, there is. And I mean, it gets a lot more complicated than that, too, because then you look at how you're going to do the work and right. you know what access you need to do the work. And it all it all goes into this big mixing pot. So we've touched on EME, we've touched on WPV. One area we've not quite touched on too much yet is around structures. And, you know, you've got about almost 600 of them. So um, how, how do you manage them? <laughs> Well, again, it's a, a very specialised uh, team there. You know, we've got structural engineers on board who um, you know, are constantly um, looking at various you know, structures in the network as to whether they need any upgrading, uh, refurbishment. And, and that's all. A lot of it's based on the, the inspection data we get back from the, the drone, either the drone inspections or the climbing inspections. So from there, you, you know, in some cases you you may look at a structure and say, well, we have to replace that structure. It's it's 60 plus years old. And, you know, if we have to replace it, it can be sometimes uh, a lot more beneficial and, and quicker to replace it than actually try to do any refurbishment works. We also, on some of these structures, we have liquid dampers, which basically limits the structure um, the structure's movement it, it upsets the uh, the natural rhythm if you like and brings it brings it back to a more controllable or makes it more stable and so the structures team's been looking at um, or we've been using accelerometers to understand movement and natural frequencies of the structure and that goes back to validate the model that they've done um, the computer model so so that's a um, you know again you know with with advancement of technology that's helped us a lot too to validate what we uh, what we're modeling you've been doing this work for quite a few years now um what is your most memorable project that you've been involved with i, I guess the more recent ones are, are probably the ones that are uh, stick in my mind more and i, right. I guess one that we did uh, about three or four years ago down in hobart in tasmania mm -hmm. at mount wellington if anyone's been down to hobart you look up i have Yep, highly you recommend it. <laughs> and you can see you can see our side at the top of Mount Wellington. Um, it's a great uh, tourist drive up there. Yeah, we had to replace the um, digital TV antenna, the FM radio antenna, and at the same time um, we installed digital audio, so DAB wow. antenna as well. And that's quite a unique site because it's basically a concrete-based structure that then has uh, steel uh, lattice steel substructure inside, and that uh, is covered by a cylindrical radome. Uh, the, all the antennas mm -hmm. have got a cylindrical radome to keep the weather and the snow and the ice away from the antennas. But we had to put up a um, temporary mast to uh, and temporary antennas to transmit these services while right. we were working uh, inside the structure. And that incorporated a, a whole raft of teams across BAI, including, you know, our customer teams, our property teams, um, mm -hmm. You know, the local um, field teams um, helped enormously. So there was, uh, as well as obviously the structures, antennas, rigging team. Yep. So we had, uh, and all, you know, EME, WPV, ev everyone had to contribute to that um, wow. to that project. And yeah. and because we have liquid dampers in, in, in that structure. Oh, um, that's one of those ones, yeah. It's one of those ones. Yeah. So so there was, it was very, it was varied. It was, um, it was challenging. Yeah. Um, you know, the antenna designs had to be, you know, it wasn't just one out of the box it was they were all quite unique yeah okay but it was uh, it was done over two summers so we we did yeah. the work over uh, two consecutive summers yeah it was very successful in the end oh, and, congratulations um, very enjoyable so yeah i'm glad to hear uh, i'd imagine you got some pretty interesting and varied weather during those <laughs> during that time <laughs> Yeah, when you get a team on site in January, just after Christmas, and they're saying it's snowing in January. <laughs> yeah. yeah, who would have thought it snows in, in yeah. January in, um, in Australia? But it, it, it certainly does. It can do Incredible. at Mount Wellington. Yep. Incredible. A, a cheeky question, Grant. Just I'm, I'm going to throw this one in there. Um, are you afraid of heights? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm aware of heights. Um, if, you, if you'd asked me when I started back in the late 80s, um, because yep. I never I never got into this business intending to, to work at height, um, and when I was first confronted with having to 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 yeah, work at height, yeah, it was confronting. It was um, yep. I, the more you do it, the more you do it regularly, the better it is. Yeah. But um, yeah, you 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 come to I guess get used to it. Yeah. Some people are a lot more comfortable with it than others, um, but uh, yeah, I have climbed for many years now, so um, 
probably not as much in the last few years <laughs> yeah um, as previously but as previous years but but yeah i respect heights lucky for all of us uh you do grant yes <laughs> <laughs> thank you so we may not always give a thought about the structure and the antenna we receive our broadcast signal from but lucky for us grant and his team do which ensures the signal is always available to us always <laughs> No matter if it's on a mountaintop, attached to the side of a building, or out in the middle of the desert, they make sure it's there. Grant, thank you. Thanks very much, Miss. BAI's Grant Shapcott telling us about the, inver- the very important role he and his team play in keeping the broadcast services on air 24 by 7 by 365 days a year. No structure, means no antenna, means no transmission, means no favourite shows. For more info on what Grant spoke about today, click on the link provided with this podcast on the webpage. If you have any questions on today's session, please get in touch with either Grant or myself. Catch you next time for session three, where we'll be joined by BAI's Jeff Dale and Matt Betts, who'll be talking to us about all things transmitters and RF systems as we dig even deeper into the engineering that makes the broadcast machine tick.